Ben, amen. You guys can have a seat this morning. Welcome to Indianola Freedom Fellowship Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're glad to have you on this holiday weekend, right? Fourth of July weekend. I hope everybody's got some plans to have some type of barbecue or some type of uh, get together so that you can enjoy friends and family and remember our independence, that America gets to be a free country, that we get to rule ourselves and um, that we are a democratic republic. So we have a say in the way this uh, country goes. And we have a, a responsibility to that. You know, um, we are in a series called Characters, Cast, and Crew. And I was thinking about it because we have some of the kids with us today as well, being that it's a holiday weekend. And I thought that we could just take a minute, and I want you guys to think of your favorite childhood movie. And you're going to share it with, a, with somebody around you, okay? Your favorite childhood movie. And as you're thinking about it, I'll share mine. And I had a really hard toss-up between Back to the Future and The Goonies, two of the greatest movies of all time. And, and I really couldn't decide what was my favorite. I've watched uh, both of them at least 50 times each, maybe more closer to 100 times each. So just turn to your neighbor and tell them your favorite childhood movie as we look into characters, cast, and crew. Favorite childhood movie. It's funny how the, the smiles kind of break out as you think about those amazing movies. Let's hear a few of them. Just shout out, what was your favorite childhood mo movie? Chitty Chitty, Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Awesome. Who else? What do you get? Sandlot. Good one. Cars. The movie Cars was awesome. I, did, I, I was a little too old for that to be my childhood, but I love that one. Anybody else? What was it? Song of the South. Song of the South. Awesome. Blood Sport. Hey, you know, <laughs> something for the whole family. <laughs> Guys, well, we are having fun in this, mo in, this, uh, in this series, Characters, Cast, and Crew. And, you know, Pastor Jeff and I, when we were putting together this series, we were kind of thinking about how much fun we'd had in uh, Nehemiah. As we walk through the character of Nehemiah, and we'd had so many conversations with so many of you guys saying, man, I didn't realize that Nehemiah was like this, or that some of the characters in this story and some of the aspects that they brought into what it was that God was doing. And so we thought, you know, what would be fun is just for several weeks through the summer to jump into different Old Testament characters. And so we're going to take 11 weeks. That we're, this is week three. We're going to just be going through different Old Testament characters. And sometimes, you know, we mention these Old Testament characters characters and you think, well, I know that name and I feel like I should probably know that person. But you know, sometimes we get so far removed from it that we just forget the significance of who they were and what they did and what their role was in the, in the script, so to speak, that God has written. And we're going to go through seven men and four ladies and just look at what their lives have to teach us today. And that kind of the, this overarching point, it's kind of vague this morning, but I want to say my, my first kind of main point to this whole thing is the characters, cast, and crew includes me and includes you. Characters, cast, and crew include, includes me and it includes you. Today we're going to be looking at Moses as a character. And what we're going to see with Moses as well as last week when we looked at Joseph and the week before that we looked at Adam, right? Adam being the first one who sinned and the, the, the problem is we've all sinned, Right? And we think, you know, it includes me and it includes you. The fact is we've all been there. We looked at Joseph and the reality that Joseph had all these situations and circumstances in his life that seemed so far outside of his control. And yet everywhere he found himself, God was there. And God was working through his story. And even in a man who was imprisoned without good cause, who was sold into slavery by his, by his own family, who found himself in all of these hardships, and then later on found himself really second in command to Egypt, the largest nation in the, in the world at that point. The characters cast in clue includes me and it includes you, that God is writing a story of our lives and he is in writing a story of all creation and he's pulled us in as the characters, the cast and the crew. Well, as we jump into looking at Moses today, we're going to be in Exodus 3, uh, chapters 3 and 4. In the first chapter of Exodus... Exodus 1 verse 8 says this, Now the, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This isn't in our 
immediate uh, text for us today, but I wanted to give a little context here. A new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Last week, we spent this time going over Joseph's story, and if we remember how that story went, Joseph, you know, this slave, and he ends up rising to the top of this kingdom, and when everything turns out really well, he ends up inviting his whole family to move down to Egypt, and they got this awesome place, and they multiply, multiply, multiply his brothers and their families, and now as time goes on in Egypt, again, as we look at this large story, it's good for us as Christ followers to understand this story. We always, I, I remember going to Bible college. I had just started walking uh, uh, with Christ. And I remember everybody's talking about the Jews and Israel and stuff. I'm like, yeah, what's the big deal with Israel? Like, what's the big deal with the Jews? This is part of our story as Christians. So these, the people uh, of Israel were in Egypt. And as a king arose that didn't know Joseph, they didn't get treated so good. You ever um, have... Are you, have you ever been in a workplace where you had a boss and you got along really, really well? That boss knew you, so you got along really well. And that boss moved on and a new boss came in and they didn't know Joseph, right? They didn't know you and you're like, hey, uh, this is kind of how it goes around there. And I'm like, I don't care. Who are you? What do you have to say about this? And this is what's happening with Joseph. And so his family's multiplied and multiplied. And there's all these Israelites and the Egyptians just said, who, who are these guys? What are they doing here? They're not from around here. And they became this enslaved nation. And now what happens as we move forward is Moses comes on the scene. And Moses' life, if we want to just look at Moses for a minute to, again, give us a little context, Moses' name comes from two different words, which is really interesting. The Hebrew form of his name means to draw out. And we know a little bit about Moses' story. Some of you may that. Uh, he was drawn up out of the Nile River. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the Egyptian word to his name means son. If you put them together, he's a son drawn out. And this is exactly who the people of Israel were. They were drawn out. They were God's chosen people drawn out of Egypt and brought into a promised land, which is part of Moses' story. If you like, as I was um, studying this, I thought, man, this is helpful for me. Moses' life is divided into three 40-year periods. He, he died at 120 years old, and every 40 years, there was this big shift in his life. At the beginning, he was raised in Egypt. The Israelites were becoming this huge part of the population, and the Egyptians turned him into slaves. Pharaoh gave the order that the Israelite male children should be killed. He says, this, this secondary group inside our population is becoming so big and expanding so much that I'm fearful that they're going to try to overcome us and overtake Egypt. And so he gives an edict. Every male Israelite child should be killed. And so that's exactly what they were doing. They're killing the, killing the male children. And so it, you, you can read up on some of this yourself as I just bird's eye fly over this. So baby Moses was born and he's so beautiful. And his mother, as you can imagine, couldn't stand to put him to death. But she knew that she not dare keep him in the home. So she puts him in a basket and puts him in the Nile River, sends him down a river. Can you imagine being in that position with your child? A hope and a prayer and you say, Lord God, take care of him. And put him in the Nile River of all places. Well, it just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter is bathing in the Nile River. And they hear the crying of a child and they find this basket and one of her Maid servants, so to speak, finds the child and says, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew child, one of the male children. And he was beautiful, and Pharaoh's daughter kind of falls in love with him. And the story continues to go on. And so Moses, long story short, gets to ra be raised in Pharaoh's household for 40 years of his life. Later on, he becomes, uh, there's, a, there's a, an argument in a, a workplace environment and Moses uh, sees that these Egyptians are treating some Israelite guys poorly. He looks around, nobody's really looking, and he beats the Egyptian to death. Moses becomes a murderer. That's quite a workplace scenario, right? <laughs> he beats this Egyptian to death. And then later on, some other guys are talking about it. They said, hey, dude, you're going to flip out and beat us to death like you beat that Egyptian to death the other day? And he realizes, oh, no. The word's out, and it's going around. And so Moses es escapes, and he, he runs away, not wanting to be thrown in prison, not wanting to face maybe 
death, knowing that he being a Hebrew had killed an Egyptian. And that's the first 40 years of his life. The next 40 years of his life, you could just, if, if you like, you could put the life as a shepherd in the land of Midian. He goes from Egypt to Midian, and for 40 years, he lives his life as a shepherd. He goes to a well, and he sees a woman there, and he helps her out, and his, her father is so grateful, and long story short, they get married, and he has kids, and he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. The last 40 years may be the most familiar 40 years for us who study the Bible so much. It's a life in the wilderness leading God's people. It starts with this proclamation to Pharaoh, let my people go, right? And he says, God says that no longer will the sons of Israel serve the Egyptians, that God wants to be worshiped by his people and that you need to let these people go into the wilderness that they may worship me. And so this is the part we're familiar with and they get hit with the 10 plagues. Later on they get released and then he gets the 10 commandments. There's instructions for building this big tent called the tabernacle where God's presence comes to dwell. There are all kinds of amazing things and you can read through it in the book of Exodus yourself. But to ratchet this down today, I wanted to give you a bird's eye view because where we're gonna jump in is in Exodus chapter three, verses one through eight. And what we're gonna see is in Exodus chapter three, This is the end of the second 40-year period of his life. Moses is 80 years old. He's still a shepherd. He's out in the fields. And that's where we're going to start in this morning. Read along with me if you would. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 say this. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So he's just moving the flock, right? Verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him in the midst of the bush and said to him, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Then the Lord said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place which you are standing is holy ground. It's the first time holy has ever been mentioned in the Old Testament right there. First time God's ever been described as holy, as set apart, as different, as holy. Verse 6, he's, he also said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Again, these are the character, cast, and crew. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. The first thing that I want to look at this morning is God's call. If you're taking notes, that won't be on the screen, but you can write God's call. And these next three points are going to be God's call on Moses. And it says this, God appeared to Moses on a regular day. God appeared to Moses on a regular day. Verses 1 through 2, saying Moses was pasturing the flock, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. Kind of our Bible quiz, how long had Moses been out there pasturing and shepherding? 40 years. 40 years is business as usual out there in the pasture, right? 40 years, it was a regular day. Day in, day out, and he saw fire. Many people, as you read and study in on this, <clears throat> they have all these different ideas of what this fire was. was, well, these bushes in certain parts of the world, they dry out and they start to smoke. And other people say, well, this is like a volcanic, a volcanic area, and so that maybe there was some volcanic stuff going on. I kind of tend to lean away from that. 
I think it's trying to explain with natural causes something that was so unique, so special, so other, that someone who had been there for 40 years pastoring and shepherding these sheep said, what in the world is that? There's something other. So Moses makes his way over there. Something caught his eye. It was strange enough to grab his attention. He says in verse 3, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight. And who else was there but the angel of the Lord? This is not just any angel, right? This is the angel of the Lord. When you're reading the Old Testament, if you read and it says an angel of the Lord, it's most likely just some other angelic being. But when you see the, the angel of the Lord, it's a Christophany, it's Jesus Christ before he came to earth in the flesh. This is what they call a pre-incarnate Christ. I know we've talked about this before, uh, like carne asada, carne is flesh, it's meat. We talked about this uh, for our Christmas series, Son of Man, that God came in meat. And so when you think about uh, that he incarnated, Jesus came into the flesh. But before that, before he was born, before the New Testament, he still shows up all over the Old Testament. Here Jesus shows up in a burning bush, the angel of the Lord crying out to Moses. I love this. <clears throat> Christians think Jesus is a pretty big deal, right? Like, Jesus. Here's Jesus crying out to Moses and what might be one of the most popular stories of the entire Bible, the burning bush. You know, Moses will later spend time with Jesus, Matthew 17, in the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus is walking on the earth in the flesh. And it's funny because it's like they kind of switch places. Jesus is now the one in the flesh and Moses shows up in the spirit with Elijah and they kind of have a powwow on the mountain. But here, Jesus is calling Moses. I wonder if out on that Transfiguration, if Moses is like, dude, remember when you called me? <laughs> like, that'd be a trip. Here's the thing that I want you guys to recognize with this point. God appeared to Moses on a regular day. You never know what God might do on a regular day. You never know what God might do on a regular day. We go through our monotonous ins and outs and we think every day is just like the next. God, do you see me in what I'm doing? Do you know what's going on? Moses had been out there for 40 years. God showed up in power. Christians hold a hope, don't we? We hold this hope close that God is real and God can do what he wants and God can show up in power and I'll make my plans and I'll carry them out to the best of my ability for his glory, but I never know when God might just show up. That's exactly what happens here. It's always a regular day before the amazing thing happens. Every day of your life, if you look back through your life and you're like, well, this day became a really significant day. You know what? Right before that, one minute before that, it was a regular day. Our life is full of regular days until God shows up, until something happens. My life was a regular day. One day I was cleaning my room. I'd been a party kid carrying on. My dad was dating this crazy lady up in Minnesota. Happens to be here today. And I was a punky teenage kid, and I was cleaning my room after a big party, and everything was a mess, believe me. <laughs> and I found a Bible under my bed, and it was a regular day until I found that Bible. How about you? You had these regular days until you interact with a holy God. It was a regular day in school when I met this Christian friend of mine. She said, you should come to my youth group. I was telling her about this Bible that I found and how crazy the things that are in it. And I just know that it's true. I don't understand all of it, but I know that it's true. And it was a regular day until she says, dude, you should come with me to youth group. God called Moses on a regular day, and Christians hold this hope that the regular days can turn into anything. And I'll tell you what, it'll be a regular day, and one day he'll split the clouds, and he'll show up, and the world will be taken back in awe. 
and they'll realize at that point there's a God who cares for us and he's real and he's created all of this and he's taking it back for himself. It was a regular day when God called Moses. The next thing is this, God called Moses and Moses called back. God called Moses and Moses called back. Verse four says this, God called him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. It's just a small point here, but it's a point nonetheless. God calls. Sometimes we act like we're the ones just searching around for God everywhere. But I'll tell you this, God calls. He calls us by name. He calls us to follow. God called out to Samuel, and Samuel says, Speak, Lord, your servant's listening. Jesus called the disciples to follow him. The apostle Paul, who was Saul, the violent aggressor and murderer of Christians, God called out to him. He says, Who are you, Lord? God calls, and he is still calling. Isaiah 45, 22, these won't be on the screen, but if you like taking notes, you can look them up later. Isaiah 45, 22 says this, turn to me, God is speaking, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. You know, in our world today, we like to pretend that there's a lot of different gods and that you have a choice. <laughs> you have a choice to follow a total deception or God. God says, I am God and there is no other. Turn to me and be saved. Matthew 9, 13 says this. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. God is calling. He's a God who calls. Acts 2, 39 says this. For the promise is for you and your children and for all those who are fall off, for as many as the Lord will call to himself. Our God is a great God who calls. And he calls us to follow. And Moses responds and he says, here I am. I ask you today, how have you responded to God's call? You know, sometimes I would say more often than not, it's not this audible call. For many of us, it's not a burning bush situation where, we st where we're stopped in our tracks to observe something and God calls our name audibly and we go, whoa. It wasn't common for Moses either, right? It was this standout event in a 120-year life that he had was this one significant point. But for us, we know he calls. We sense him in those dark moments. We sense him in those quiet times. We sense him near to us. We sense him beckoning us to do something different in our life, different than we would have just thought up on our own. We wouldn't say, oh, it was just me being good or thinking better or doing different. No, we would say, God is real. God has called me. How have you responded to his call? Do you do as I do sometimes and ignore him as though he hasn't called? Do you avoid him in the awkward moment by shifting your focus quickly to something else, maybe in those dark times to just pull out your phone and scroll because you have this awkward feeling that you're not alone even though you are? Do you ignore him? Do you avoid him? Do you look him in the face, as it were, and demand more, God, unless it's a burning bush experience, I won't follow you. I pray when he speaks to you, you respond. I pray when he speaks to me, I would respond and be found faithful. Call back to him. Well, God appeared to Moses on a regular day, and God called Moses, and Moses called back. And the third point is this. God was on the move and invited Moses along for the ride. God is on the move and invited Moses along for the ride. Verse seven says this, the Lord said, surely I've seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because, their task, because of their taskmasters. I am aware of their sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them. God has been watching Moses while Moses has been watching sheep. God has been listening to the cries of help from the people while Moses has been listening to the bellering in the field. And while Moses was moving his father-in-law's flock to another point on the, on the big mountain, God was moved to deliver the people from the power of the Egyptians. 
God still sees and God is listening and God still chooses to deliver. We're going to go through something really quick here, and I feel like I could cut it short today. But I want to go through these because I thought as this message just like came together. It's like, boop. And sometimes you think, well, Lord, maybe you've got somebody for this in the room, but this is just some really typical stuff. But I want you to see this about Moses today. I'm going to go through five quick points, and they're Moses' objections. So if you're taking notes, you can put Moses' objections. Because here's the thing. God has a call on Moses, and it is very vivid here. And he has five objections Moses has to God. First one is this. Who am I that I should go? And and, and this is the thing to these objections. We're learning about the characters, cast, and crew of the Old Testament, but we're seeing how we're part of the story, how I'm part of this. And I can guarantee we've all felt this right here. Who am I that I should go? Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? If you look at Moses' credentials, they're not very great. He was a refugee and a displaced people group. He was not a native to the land. He was one of few men from a whole generation of male babies killed. Did you ever think about Moses was one of the few male babies that escaped that? Think about all the Hebrew women that would look at him and think, I had, a, I had a son that would be that age. He grew up one of the few male Hebrew children. He was adopted. He, became, he was adopted by Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. He was a murderer and a coward. After he murdered, he ran. And then he laid low as a shepherd for 40 years of his life. And now he's in this, this situation where God is speaking to him, where Jesus has showed up in power. And he says, who am I? His humility turns into an objection. It's like, no, no, no. Who am I? God answers in verse 12. He says, certainly I will be with you. God's answer to his objection is not, Moses, you're good enough, you're bright enough, and doggone it, people like you. God says, I will be with you. Don't question me. My authority is significant enough. When God is with us, we are qualified, we are empowered, we are emboldened. Sometimes we feel just the same, and so it's hard to believe it. Other times we do feel God's presence giving us wisdom and direction. But when God is with us, we're qualified. Objection number two was this. What will I say? You ever have God impress on you to talk to somebody in your life about him? They're going through something and you've gone through maybe something similar and the only place you ever found any help or solace was in God himself and you thought, man, maybe I should say something. But then it hits you, the objection number two. What will I say? Verse 13 is exactly what Moses runs into. He says, Moses said to God, Hold him, am I going to the sons of Israel? And I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they will say to me, what is his name? And what shall I say to them? When they start asking questions about whose God is, how, how will I answer? And we have the same question all the time. I mean, look at God's answer. Verse 14, and it won't be on the screen here, but he says, I am who I am. This was his answer. What, what will I tell them about God? When they start asking questions about me, for me, what, what will I say? And God just says, I am who I am. And he goes on, he says, I'm the God of their fathers. And he does some lists. And to the Israelites, that would have meant something. But when you say, I am who I am, what is God saying with this curious title? It is the deepest theological statement that he could have possibly made. And we definitely do not have time, nor do I have the mental capacity to tease all this out for what it significantly means. But I will tell you this, God is. He is now. God is not a maybe. Well, when I start talking to them, they start asking me questions. What shall I say? Tell them God is. Here's the deal. There's a real God, and he is. It's not a maybe. We can sit around and wrangle about different character qualities about him, but I can tell you this. He is. He now exists. When you feel like you are not good enough, sufficient, wise enough, capable, God is. 
He's saying all this and more in that statement. I am. I am. If you're struggling with something in your life today, whatever it would be, God says, I am. He's got it in his hand. He is all. When the disciples were worried about what to say, Matthew 10, 19, Jesus tells them, when they hand you over, don't worry about what you're going to say. It'll be given to you in that hour. <laughs> if you're a planner, that's like anxiety meltdown, right? Jesus looks like, guys, seriously? You're thinking, we're going to be for kings, judges, authorities that have our life in their hand for life and death. And you're going to tell us, don't worry about that. Dude, you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. God's saying, I got you. I'll put it right in you. Our God is a fantastic God, but yet we have our objections, and Moses had his. Objection number three is this. What if they won't believe me or listen to what I say? <laughs> you ever had that feeling? I'm thinking about talking to somebody about the Lord, but what if they don't believe me, and what if they don't listen to what I say? Or I've got this great thing I'm going to tell them about who God is, and I've got it all figured out, but what if, what if they don't believe me? And that's exactly, literally, word for word what Moses says in chapter 4, verse 1. What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? Or they will say, the Lord has not appeared to you. You don't know God. That never happened. You start telling somebody about your life, and they say, well, I'm so glad that you got your life straightened up. You're like, dude. I didn't get my life straightened up. I found someone who straightened up my life. God did it. God's answer to Moses for this objection is interesting in verses uh, four through eight and the following verses. He basically starts doing these signs. He says, throw your staff on the ground. And so he does it and it turns into a snake. And he says, put your hand in your jacket. And so he does that, pull it out. Ah, it's leprous and it's all got sores and boils and all this stuff and it's freaky. Just put it back in there, and he does it again. He pulls it back out, and it's healed. God's saying, I have power that you don't even know about. And he, and he, and he goes through several things. He gets to this point where he says, <clears throat> in chapter 4, verse 8, if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, maybe they will believe the witness of the last sign. But even if they do not believe these two signs or heed what you say, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water which you pour out will become blood on the dry ground. Now, this, not everybody has to answer this, but this is a Bible trivia. Does Moses end up with God's power having to turn water to blood in the plagues? He does. Moses turns the water into blood and they pour it out and everything's there's blood. Everything turns to blood, all their Water, even in holding jars, all turns to blood. But here's the, here's the Bible trivia. Does it convince them? Do the Egyptians say, dude, time to let these people go? Uh -uh. It's not the last plague. When, God, when he says, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? God gives them all these examples of these miracles that will happen. Do the miracles convince the Egyptians to let them go? No. Well, what's up with that? God will do the convicting. God will do the convincing. When God calls us and says, hey, you will be my disciples and you will go into all the nations of the earth proclaiming to, me all, proclaiming to them all that I have given you, right? The great commission, when God commissions his people to go, he doesn't say, and you will be really smart and you will convince them all of exactly what I, he says, I'll do that. I'll do that through my power. And yet we have the objections, don't we? Objection number four, I have never been good enough and I'm still not good enough. I've never been good enough and I'm still not good enough. Exodus 4, chapter 4, verse 10, if you want to read his response, Moses says to the Lord, please, Lord. This is his fourth objection to God as he's coming up with excuses. Why I can't do this. Remember, he's talking to a burning bush. Right? His shoes are off because the bush said, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. And there's this interaction. He says, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past. 
nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow in speech and slow in tongue. I love that. When God calls you to do something, you say, God, I'm not good enough right now. God, in your call for me, this is what he's saying, in the fact that you're talking to me right now, I'm still not good enough. Even since you have spoken to me, I'm still not good. I just have a feeling that there's somebody that God wants to use in powerful ways that's right here. And we have excuses and we just say, uh, who am I? What would I say? Well, what if they don't believe me? Please, God, I'm not good enough. Is this us? It's me, man. It's me all over. Moses is part of God's character cast and crew, and I can tell you for sure it is me all over. God, I'm not good enough. Not recently. (laughs) Not right now since you've spoken, and never in the past am I good enough. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Hebrews 11, 32 through 34 talks about all these great people of faith. And then he says, people who have quenched the fire and escaped the edge of the sword from weakness were made strong. Moses says, I'm not good enough, God. And God says, I use weak things because I'm not. God loves to use weak things. But look at God's answer to that in uh, verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11. To the, I'm not good enough, I'm still not good enough. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you are to say. God, I'm not good enough. I've never been good enough. And I'm not going to be good enough. And God just looks at you in the face and says, dude, I made you. Who do you think I am that's calling you? I made your mouth. God, my, 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 my mind's not smart enough. I made your brain. My background, God, don't you know what I've been through? He says, I was there through it all. I am the author. Our excuses don't stand up to God. Neither did Moses' excuses stand up to God. And eventually it begins to question God's goodness if we miss the blessing that he's calling us to, having a front row seat to his power to save, to experience just a fraction of his goodness, to witness the joy of burdens lifted, the chains broken, and purposes being found. When you enlist, when you're enlisted into God's good work, you see great things we stick with the excuses not so much the fifth objection is this as we wrap up please lord send somebody else just send somebody else this is the first time that god gets mad four other objections god doesn't get mad at all he understands our fallen nature he understands exactly where we're at but verse 13 he says Please, Lord, just send the message by whomever you will. Anybody but me is what he's saying. And the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. God's answer in that was to get Aaron and Moses together, and we're going to do this. And and Moses ends up responding, right? But as we wrap up, what I want you guys to see is what was Moses was known for, a guy who knew God as a friend, that they talked as friends. God isn't upset about all your excuses. He's not sitting there angry and furious. He's sitting there saying, I am going to work this out. I know how I made you. I know everything about you. And believe me, if you have something in your heart that says, I need to share this good news with anyone else, and I need to act and live in a different way, at any point in time, can I tell you that's God in you? That's not you being smart or clever. And it's a call. It's a call. Characters, cast, and crew includes me. It includes you. Let's say that all together one time as we wrap up. The characters, cast, and crew includes me and includes you. Friends, it's a fact. Let's pray as we close. 
Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this wonderful day. God, we thank you for Moses. We think of all the things you did through this servant who was full of so many excuses. And later on, Lord, you carved out the Ten Commandments and you had him march through the waters, Lord. You had him wandering around and leading your people for 40 years in the wilderness, God. He had so many experiences after this call when he said yes. Lord Jesus, if there's somebody here today that just hasn't responded to your call, it happens on a regular day. Pray, Lord, that they would just turn their life to you, that they would realize that, God, you have paid and done all that's necessary to reconcile God and man, to bring friendship again through Jesus' poured blood on the cross as we remembered with communion this morning. Lord Jesus, and as we go out into the world today, I pray, Father, on this holiday weekend that we would celebrate with joy and smiles and laughter and gratitude with the good things that you have done, Lord. We will praise you, Father. You're calling us to be your men and your women as we know that you are. We pray, Father, we would heed your voice and that we would respond for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, enjoy this weekend. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you again real soon.